Happy May, everybody, and welcome to the very first garden tour of the season. I was trying to hold off for a beautiful sunny spring day to film this video, but I just don't think it's going to happen. As many of my fellow gardeners know, the spring has just been wonky. Very cold, very wet, and I almost didn't film this video because when I went back and looked at last year's garden in early May, it was so much further ahead of this year that this is almost embarrassing. But then I thought, no, this is actually a really good opportunity to share with other gardeners just how much difference there can be from year to year based on the weather. And there's the sun peeking out just a little bit. <laughs> now for anyone new to the channel, I am gardening in zone 6A, Ohio, and my last estimated spring frost date is right around May 10th. But I never plant out any of my frost tender or warm season crops until at least the middle of May, sometimes more towards the end of May. So you won't see any of those out here yet. Might not be the safest option, but it does let me get a good view of the garden. So let's take a look at what is going on inside the garden right now. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is not strictly gardening related, but it is these two completely useless contraptions. If you saw my getting rid of moles video, you may have seen this one before. This is supposed to kill moles. It worked, I think the first two times we used it, it has not worked since. The moles just tunnel around it. I bought this one on a suggestion. It's called a gopher hawk. Completely useless as far as I can tell, but if anyone has this and it has worked, to catch moles, I'd love to hear from you. I point this out because I'm going to show you in a minute here the kind of horrific things that moles can do to your garden, particularly what they did to my strawberry bed over the winter. So this is what the strawberry bed looks like right now. Compare this to last year at roughly the same time, and you will notice just how many empty bare spots are in here. Now this is where plants have died out, and what happened is that through the winter, moles were tunneling through these beds. Now the combination of the moles disrupting the plant roots and the natural freeze-thaw cycle of our late winter, early spring, a lot of these plants actually heaved out of the ground and died. Now luckily, I was in the process of transitioning the strawberry bed anyway. Some of these plants were getting pretty old and I wanted to convert this to something else while moving my strawberries elsewhere but it's still really disappointing to have this happen. So just another reason to be on top of the mole problem. Now this bed will be one of my experiments for the year. I'm actually gonna dig all of this fill dirt out, line the bottom with hardware cloth and refill it. My goal here is to make a vole proof sweet potato bed. So voles, unlike moles, will actually eat plants. They love sweet potatoes. I had a lot of damage to my big, beautiful sweet potatoes last year. So I'm gonna try this out on a small scale and see if it works for me. The raised beds up here are fairly empty. Um, I'm gonna wait and fill these mostly with warm season stuff. Do have some peas there. This spinach, this was a seed tape that I planted, which is working out well. I'll be harvesting that for baby spinach soon. Little, little radishes and salad turnips because those will be quickly out of here. In fact, those prob yeah, those are gonna need thinned very soon. They're already, oh, they're so cute. Already forming little bulbs. More carrots, more rhubarb, yarrow. I love this plant, but this was a bad choice for a raised bed because yarrow does spread and take over. So eventually I'm going to have to dig these out and replant them. More spinach. This was started February 16th indoors and I transplanted this out on March 15th. I've got some pansies back there, volunteer calendula, more rhubarb, and my blackberries back there, which I'm going to have to figure out a better support system for. In this bed, I've got a bunch of volunteer bachelor buttons, endive, escarole, bulb fennel. This was started from seed indoors on March 5th, and I transplanted this on April 22nd. And some more carrots started on March 21st. 
my little Ben gooseberry is doing quite well right now. And I've got a lot of blooms on here. So I'm really hoping for a heavy crop load this season. And this is pretty much the situation I've been dealing with for two months now. It's just wet and mucky and muddy and gross. And my garden paths are completely destroyed. I have to get in here and refill this all with wood mulch. But by having my actual growing spaces elevated, most of my plants are doing all right. They're not sitting down in standing water and drowning. In these two beds, I have an interesting experiment going on. At least it's interesting to me. I'm never sure if these things are actually interesting to other people. But a couple of years ago, I did a pea planting experiment where I soaked and sprouted one batch of peas and direct sowed the other. This year, I'm adding another element to this experiment. I've got one batch of peas, which I started indoors in potting media and I transplanted outdoors. I have one group that I soaked overnight and then sprouted on paper towels and then planted. And I have one group that I direct sowed into the garden. And all of these peas were started in their respective processes on the same date, and that was March 9th. So right now, the transplanted peas have a pretty significant lead. And all of these peas have gone through some pretty frigid temperatures. We got down, I think, to the mid or low 20s, and you can see that cold damage on the foliage. But what's great about peas is they take that cold like champs and they just keep on growing. They grow right out of it. Now, early on, my soaked and sprouted peas seem to have a pretty good jump start over the direct zone. But at this point, they look pretty darn close. The soaked and sprouted might be just a smidge bigger, but at first glance, they look very, very similar. So what I am looking to find out with this experiment is if one of these groups have a significantly earlier maturity than the others. And I will be sure to share that in a later video. Here's another group of plants I am really excited about. I know, I'm, I'm excited about everything, but I can't, I can't help it. This is my overwintered onion test and last year I grew a variety called Winteria. I was really pleased with the results from that but I wanted to try several other varieties that were specifically recommended for overwintering. So in here I've got Red Spring, Bridger, one called T488, Desert Sunrise, and also the Winteria. And the T488 had the best survival rate and looks to be the furthest along maturity wise. Now what's really exciting to me is when I compare these to my spring planted onions, I think I'm going to get a pretty significant jump on the harvest this year. So if you watch the overwintering video, I think with those onions, I got maybe a two or three week earlier harvest with the overwintered onions versus the spring planted. I think it's going to be a lot bigger than that this year, which really encourages me and does make me want to do overwintered onions every year. Garlic up here, all planted November 9th. These are not super happy because it has just been too wet. That's why you're seeing some of the yellowing on those bottom leaves. If it would ever dry out, <laughs> they will be just fine, but they do not love being this wet all the time. And back in the back, I've got primarily a lot of brassicas, cover crops, um, a few other cool season things. But I had to stop myself from filling up all the available space because I need room for things like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants and flowers and everything else. But back here, I've got one of my favorite cover crop blends. This is a spring green manure. It's got winter peas, oats, and vetch. Some more late planted peas back there just starting to come up. You can see these were planted on April 10th, how tiny those still are. This I'm excited to see the results of. So all of my winter sown vegetables, I tried to plant with a version that was started indoors. So in this case, this is Verde de Taglio chard. These were winter sown February 2nd. I just transplanted them yesterday. These were some that were started indoors. Um, February 11th, I believe, and transplanted out early April. So I'm really interested to see how these end up by the time they're mature. And if there's one garden product that I cannot live without, it is probably these insect nettings. I got these from Ag Fabric, and these have been a total game changer in my garden. You've probably seen me rave about them in other videos, but with my brassicas in particular, I cannot grow them 
without spraying because cabbage worms will just decimate my brassica crops. So these are my go-to. As soon as I put my brassica transplants out, the netting goes over them. Potato onions, beets that are just starting to come up. Back there, I've got fennel and celery. Oh, look how gorgeous these are. And these. And back here in this lovely field of green, I honestly just like looking at this, it makes me happy. This is my rye cover crop. This was an area that I had chickens in for the majority of last year. They got this all worked up, fertilized. I came in um, early last fall and planted it in rye. This was a problem area of the garden because it's low lying. The soil was very, very compacted, very poor draining. So I've just basically been doing whatever I can to improve the soil back here. And the plan back here is to mow this rye down when it starts shedding pollen. And I'll come in here and plant my sweet corn this year. And let me show you a few more things that are going on outside of the garden fence. I kind of keep expanding the garden outward. I can't help myself. Back behind the garden, don't mind the grass that desperately needs cut. It's been way too wet to mow and I tried to get the push mower out only to realize that it is not functioning currently. But we do keep this all in lawn because grass clippings are one of the most valuable natural mulches that I have access to. Oh, and these are a new addition. I've got three reachable size. So basically these are super dwarf apple trees. And these are varieties which are supposed to be extremely resistant to seed or apple rust because I have some major, major pressure as this woods behind me is filled with cedar that all have the uh, cedar galls on them. And I have to show you the cedar gall because it's kind of weird and cool. Apparently this is nicknamed Kush gall, which is fitting because it looks like those little Kush balls that we used to play with. Very cool looking, not so cool when it's spreading cedar rust to your apple trees. Here's one of my potato plantings. It was too wet to get in and do my traditional trench and hill method, which I prefer for potatoes. So these were actually planted just on top of mounds of compost and covered with straw mulch. When I did this technique last year, my yields weren't quite as high, but at least I got some potatoes. Another little planting experiment going on here, I was testing different planting dates for garlic. So I've got one batch which was planted on November 9th, one on November 18th, one on December 1st, and one on March 15th. And the garlic that I planted on March 15th, I did cold stratify in the refrigerator to mimic that normal cold dormancy period that they would receive through the winter. And what I want to see here is if it makes any difference in terms of the maturity and size of the bulbs. Now, right now, they all look pretty much the same, except for the ones planted in March. So it will be interesting to see at the end how these all turn out. And back here, we've got the hugel beds. This is my hugel culture bed, my newer one. I had to fence this all off because the bunnies were eating everything. Basically my plan for this is primarily fruit plants. So I've got some currants, honeyberries or hascaps. I've got some pawpaws planted over there. I've also got horseradish and rhubarb in here. And I plan on planting a few more berries. But I'm also using this kind of as a place to just stick all my extra seedlings. <laughs> so if these don't turn out or get all eaten by bugs, it's not a big loss to me. But you can see there, the bunnies took that celery seedling completely down. They've been nibbling on this broccoli. So hopefully the fence will stop them. This is my older Google culture bed. And I had a bunch of leftover hay from the chicken yard through on top here as a mulch. I think I'm gonna go in here with tomatoes. I'm not 100% sure yet. Welcome to the jungle, the elderberry jungle that is. I probably should have trimmed these guys because it's gonna be really hard to reach the fruit that sets clear up there. 
but I'm really happy with how well these are doing and I'm hoping for lots of fruit this year because I do love elderberry syrup. I had to fence this off too because the bunnies were eating my strawberry plants. And I've got a new little peach tree in here. Strawberries under there. Again, that netting is just bunny protection because I ran out of fence. This is my new bed. If you watched my uh, using chickens in the garden video, I talked briefly about this, but my plan is to uh, rebuild my medicinal herb garden in this area, but I've also got some fruit plants, some dwarf raspberries and blackberries planted in here. Once I'm done amending all that soil, a fence will go up around this so that I can avoid the bunny problems. And over here, my potted collection just <laughs> kind of keeps growing and growing and growing. So all my blueberries that I've had out here for a long time, um, I've added some container raspberries. This was the raspberry shortcake that I potted up in the container raspberry videos. This is a container blackberry called uh, baby cakes, I believe, planted in just the same way as the raspberry. And then I've got all my potatoes and grow tubs back here. This guy, I actually started early. I had a bunch of potatoes that were sprouting like crazy in my basement. So I stuck them in a grow tub in early, early March. And this has been in my greenhouse till just recently. Hence all, all the growth on this thing. The potatoes planted outside, it's just been too cold. They've yet to really do much of anything, but they will soon. And another peach tree, my rhubarb, which will hopefully be ready to harvest here. <laughs> and this is all squirrel and chipmunk protection. So in here, I've got some Snack Hero snap peas and some bachelor's button. And in here are my carrots. Well, these desperately need thinned, but I was running out of space in my garden beds for carrots. So I decided... <coughs> So I decided just to grow them in some of these big containers. Carrots are relatively easy to grow in containers. The key is really just making sure they stay consistently moist and giving them a high quality potting medium to grow in. So I find that root crops in general do better in the soil for me just because of the mineral content that's in my soil. So oftentimes I'll actually try to mix some of my native soil with a good quality, rich potting mix to grow root vegetables in containers. And now, if you guys want, we can take a quick jaunt over to my mom and pops because I've got more gardening goodness going on over there. Now the first big planting we've got here is more garlic. We really, really love our garlic. And this is not just my family, it's mom and dad and my brother and sister as well. So it's a lot of people share, sharing in the garlic bounty. And interestingly, these beds were all dressed with composted cow manure before we planted the garlic. And most of these varieties are significantly larger than the ones I have planted at home, which did not have manure. Which makes sense because garlic can definitely benefit from a little extra nitrogen boost in the spring. In addition to the garlic I just showed you, I've got some brassicas planted, more onions, but in a lot of these beds you will see cover crop or composted manure. And that is because we are focusing on adding some nourishment back into the soil prior to planting again for another season. Now I don't have as much planted here. I've been spending more time kind of on infrastructure projects. And one of my big ones last week was getting all of these panels prepped for tomatoes. Now you can see, I still have to get the cattle panels up to the top of these posts, but I got all those posts driven and the cattle panels in place. So this whole section will be for tomatoes. And I might mix in some cucumbers and pole beans into this area as well, just to kind of break up the tomato plantings. And there are so many lovely fruit trees in bloom over here right now.
So that pretty much wraps up what is going on in the garden right now. If you enjoyed today's video and would like to see more updates of my garden through the season, be sure to subscribe to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.